Hey, you. Hey, you with the wheel. Hey, mate. Pick the right one here, Barney. Who, <laughs> me? My name is McCann. Terry McCann. Are you the minder? Yes. In 1979, Houston Films commenced production on a new series called Minder. Originally, the series was conceived as a vehicle for Dennis Waterman to star in. Waterman had been extremely popular in Houston's hard-hitting police drama, The Sweeney, in which he co-starred alongside John Thor. While Waterman was cast as ex-con and boxer Terry McCann, the role of his new partner of Arthur Daly was given to accomplished actor George Cole. He recalls how he first came to hear his new character. I was playing in Brimstone and Treacle, um, in London and my agent rang up and said would you go and meet Lloyd Shirley and Verity Lambert and one or two other people on your way to the theatre and I said well, what, what for and they said well they want to see you because they want to talk to you about a part and uh, I said but I, I've worked for them they know me what, what, what do I have to go and see them for Anyway, I said, you know, um, it, it was very bad winter, winter, wintry weather. I think it was January. I said, anyway, the journey, by the time I get up there, I don't feel like going to see anyone. So I didn't go. And then, again, about three days later, she said, look, would you just go into the... I mean, it was a Cav new Cavendish Hotel in German Street and have a Coca-Cola just before you go to the theatre. So I said, oh, all right. I went in and... They handed me a format of Minder and um, said, would you like to read that before we talk about it? So I read it. I read the first page and I said, I, I don't need to read any more. I wouldn't do this. Um, the format described Arthur Daly as uh, fully behind the Home Secretary as far as uh, crime was concerned. Um, his favourite film was The Godfather. And he dressed like a dodgy member of the Citizens Advice Bureau. And I think that's what swung me. And I didn't, I didn't read any more, and I didn't get a script either. Well, cut a long story short, three weeks later we started filming. He thought the job centre was a new pub, didn't you, my son? I am his governor, I pay his stamps. Stamps you? When have you Don't ever... interrupt. He is not one of three million, he is a fraud. Do not be misled by the hang dog expression, young man. Oh, lady. really? I am going to chin you in a minute. I'll bring you tidings of great joy, Terence. A wedge in your sky, a wonger in your wallet, and the info is for your ears only. Well, I suppose I'd better have a word with him. I would as well. Job centres, I'd put this country back on its feet. Can you come back and tell me what happens? Yeah, I can come back about six. How's that? I uh, could even take you out, buy you a drink. Yeah. OK. See? You meet me and suddenly you get a result. What's a nice girl like that doing in a nasty place like this? Minder wasn't the first time that Dennis and George had worked together. When people have said to me, and to Dennis, had we worked together before, um, we both remember the Sweeney, but in fact we had been in a film together, and we both denied the other one was in it. We were sitting in the car on location on Minder, and Dennis was in the front with a girl, and um, he was talking about a film he'd been in, and I was sitting in the back, and I said, you weren't in that film? I was. He said, no, you weren't. It turned out that by the time I came into the film, Dennis had been killed and was lying face down in the hall. And I stepped over him. <laughs> and that was the uh, one time we denied each other having been in it. The film so fondly remembered by George was the 1970 low-budget British shocker, Fright. Could his appearance as a businessman in the Sweeney have made him the natural choice for Arthur Daly? The fact that I was playing a businessman in the Sweeney, in just one episode. Um, I don't think that had any bearing on my being cast for Minder, because it was, I think, as I remember, a very straight businessman. So I don't think that had any bearing on it at all. When we started, no one was quite sure which way we were going. 
And I think the series was designed to replace the Sweeney, uh, particularly as far as Dennis was concerned. Many of the Euston Films production crew followed Dennis from the Sweeney to Minder. Uh, the Euston team uh, had been together quite a time before Minder um, because they did the Sweeney. And um, they worked very, very hard. They were a wonderful crew. Um, and they, they did play hard. Um, they used to go off to the pub at lunchtime, uh, practically en masse, and then um, come back about a quarter of an hour before time to go back to work and have their lunch. And uh, I was a bit of a misery, and I never went with them, because I, 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 I can't drink when I'm working. Uh, and anyway, I like to have the break. And uh, one day I foolishly said to Dennis, look, on Friday it's my birthday, so I'll break all my rules and I'll come down the pub at lunchtime and I'll buy you all a drink. So he said, oh, we went and told everyone. But what I didn't know was when we got there, he went out on the street and started telling people to come in because I was buying the drinks for the first time ever. And um, having got over that one, uh, he then said, right, every Friday you buy the drinks. And I said, no, 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 e every fifth Friday. And that's the way it was. <laughs> you, 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 you clock those two. What, the Bible bashes? Yeah, it's a bit strong, isn't it? I mean, men at a cloth knocking back pints in a cocktail bar. Now they're allowed to drink. Yeah, but only red wine, isn't it? Oh, care to join us in a libation, Padre? Thank you. The one pint of this excellent ale will suffice. Fair dues. Moderation in all things. Come on, let's get out of here. They're putting me off my fruit salad. Oh, it, it was a wonderful unit. And, I mean, um, for instance, we had a um, camera operator. Um, and he was a wonderful operator. But what was so important when you played a scene, he would come out from behind the camera and just meet your eye and either say, it's working, or uh, I think we better have another one, which meant something was not working. And that was terribly valuable, because he was the one who was seeing what, what was going to be on the screen, and the only one at that moment. So it was very valuable. But they were all marvellous, they were really great crew. George was also very pleased with the series' writers and directors. We had wonderful writers. I mean, I think what attracted um, a lot of top actors to the series was the scripts, because they were always good. Um, to say that I had a favourite writer would be wrong, or a favourite director. Um, after we'd done the first series, and they were said they're going to do a second one. Dennis and I said, well, um, what are we going to do about directors? Because there's one or two that we, we don't want back, thank you. And um, we agreed that there were so many directors we didn't know that we couldn't really ask for director approval. So we asked for director disapproval, which meant that uh, we, we could say, no, we don't want him, and we don't want him. <laughs> so uh, that... that um, that was very valuable because we were able to keep the ones that we got on with. He was also enjoying working with his co-star. I think we circled each other for about two or three days uh, and then it clicked and it just went like clockwork. It was a joy to do and I mean working with Dennis was absolutely wonderful. Um, It, it, it took two or three days, and then uh, we said, you know, what are we f worrying about? And in fact, we, we had, um, in the original first series, um, we had a, an old broken-down Green Line bus, which was the makeup bus, the wardrobe bus, and our bus for getting changed in. So after the first series, and we, re we realised we were going on, uh, we said we'd like a... Winnebago. And um, sure enough, the following week, two Winnebagos, one each. Well, that lasted about a week because we got fed up going backwards and forwards to each other saying, what are we going to do about this and what are we going to do about that? <coughs> so we said, we'll just have one 
um, with room at the front for Dennis and room at the back for me. And that's the way it was from then on. I could be doing other things, you know. Could be at the dogs. Acne. Dogs? Terry, this is where it's at. Your own county's set. Your Mark Phillips lot. Contacts, innit? Combine business with pleasure. I've got a smashing lance here I'm trying to unload. 1979 logbook. Only 14 hour on the clock. Not a trace of rust. Got a bomb with a chin, that's one I should think. Oh, I smell that affluence. You don't get that at Acne Dog Track. No. It's done. You're standing in it. The production team of Lloyd Shirley, George Taylor, Verity Lambert and Johnny Goodman made George's working life very easy. The producers used to come down on the set from time to time, uh, Lloyd Shirley and George Taylor, um, but they seemed, always seemed very happy. Um, the only significant thing they ever said to me was, um, we were at base one time and I was sitting in my car it was lunchtime. And this must have been about the third or fourth episode. And as they came back, I think from the pub, um, to their office, they stopped and Lloyd said to me, you seem to be finding a lot of comedy in this, George. And I said, well, it, it's there, you know, it's, it's on the page. Um, and that's about as far as it went. Um, I think Dennis used to go and see Rushes in the evening from time to time. I didn't because I had a fairly long drive home. Um, so I really only saw them before the series started. Verity Lambert was very much hands-on, um, although she was executive producer. Um, Johnny Goodman, um, we used to see him quite a lot which we were happy about because he was the man who signed the cheques. Um, but uh, certainly Verity and also uh, Linda Agron, who was script editor, uh, was very much in evidence. Um, but Lloyd and, and George, as I say, they were there, um, but they, didn't, in, they did, didn't interfere. Minder was the brainchild of Leon Griffiths a prolific writer who began his career penning episodes of the late 1950s ITV production of The Adventures of Robin Hood, starring Richard Green. George Cole remembers Leon with great fondness. He was wonderful. We met for lunch one day, I mean, once the series was really going. And um, he said, what are you going to have to drink? And I said, well, I'm going to have a um, spicy tomato juice. So he said, well, what's that like? And I said, well, it's lovely. He said, well, I'll try one of those. So he had one. And uh, he says, I think this is very good. I think I could give up alcohol for this. Um, sadly, he had, um, um, I think he had a stroke um, during the series. Um, but he, he got out of it and got himself together again and came back and was writing. And his, his scripts were very gritty. Um, I mean, you can recognize them as opposed to other people's scripts. Nice man. Now listen, as far as I'm concerned, I work for Mrs. Costos. So while I'm in the restaurant, you don't talk to me, you don't come near me. Because I don't like you. And I'm having a lot of trouble trying to keep it a secret. No answer. The first series of Minder wasn't an immediate success with the general public. Well, the first series we did, I think we did 11 episodes, um, and it was a dis disastrous start because uh, Thames Television went on strike. So we did all the hype, and then the series didn't start when it was meant to. I think it was meant to start in September and for the autumn, and in fact it started in January. Nothing much happened in the first series that they um, went wild about. Um, so it was quite surprising when um, the producer said we're going ahead with another series. So we went ahead with another series and again, um, nothing to write home about as far as reaction was concerned. 
But then the third series, we suddenly went into the ratings and we went right up. And you became aware of this happening by taxi drivers saying, as are indoors. Or the other one was, why don't you pay that boy a bit more money? And things like that. And that's when you, you, you twigged that um, it was going into the um, consciousness. Many people have wondered if George based the Arthur Daly character on a specific person. Mostly the character of Arthur Daly came off the page. I wouldn't have said there were many Arthur Daly's around at the time, but I think Minder created some, uh, and you, you, you keep seeing them and hearing about them. Right the way through, it, it was a joy to play. It had to come off the page because we got the script on Friday to start shooting on Monday. We shot that for two weeks, and the second Friday we got the next script. So, you know, it had to be in the writing, um, and it was. So George takes no credit for any input into Arthur's character. I didn't have any input in terms of stories or scripts or anything like that, but uh, I had a bit of output, I suppose you might call it. Um, the director of the very first episode said, look, I don't want him to be a spiv. I want you to go and get a couple of good suits made, um, Savile Row type suits, nice suits. So I said, fine. And he said, but um, I wouldn't, don't mention it to anyone at the moment. So I went and got these two suits made. And uh, I think it was about the second episode, um, there was a fight sequence. And the director said to me, when the fight comes this way, you go in and get into it. And I said, do you know how much this suit cost? He said, no, why? I said, if I get this torn, the producers will murder me, and you. So he said, what, what, can, what, what can we do? I said, well, I think as soon as the fight comes this way, I go that way. And from then on, whenever there was a fight, I was always seen going that way or that way, but never getting involved in the fight. So that, I, I, I had that much uh, input. Well, it's uh, all a great mystery to me, Mr. Um, um, what, uh, what did you say your name was? Cyril Ash. You call me Cyril. Uh, Cyril, yes. Um, look, supposing I did have this item that you mentioned, I'm not saying that I have, mind you, but if I did have, what, um, what sort of business arrangement had you got in mind? Well, quite a simple one. Mm -hmm. You give me the tape, mm -hmm. or I'll smash your kneecaps. Oh! Very reasonable. Very reasonable indeed. Although George says he didn't have very much creative input into Arthur's character, he did introduce one of Minder's most fondly remembered ad-libs. We had quite a few ad-libs. Um, we never used to ad-lib deliberately. Uh, very often we had to ad-lib to get out of a spot where something went wrong and we didn't want to stop. But I think my favourite ad-lib was a line given to me by my son, who said he'd been in a pub and he heard this wonderful line. He said it was straight out of Minder. He said this man put his ar arm around this young man and said, my son, I'm telling you, the world is your lobster. I took out my wallet, I gave him 25 pounds, I said, don't you say that, tell that to anyone else, that's mine. I'm, I'm going to keep that. And I did, and I sat on it for about two years, until suddenly we were doing a boxing uh, episode, I think it was uh, Rocky Eight and a Half, and um, I, I, I put it in. And um, the man who created the series um, came up to me about 18 months later and said, I believe I owe you £12.50. And Dennis had obviously told him this story. And uh, he said, I thought that was one of the best lines I'd ever written. Great, ain't it? We're on again next month. Forget that. Forget it. The world is your lobster, my son. You've got a new career. People's champion. 